Okay. Wow. First of all, I'm like super geek right now. Super geek. I'm Christy Taylor. This is the Christy Taylor Show, a special edition. And you're going to find out in just a few moments why I am geeked out. Okay. First of all, spring has sprung and new editions of the Christy Taylor Show is happening. And today I have a chance to talk to someone who is very dear to my heart, a dear friend of mine who after two decades working in the private sector, like Keith and Mason decided to pursue his passion for the art full time, capturing important moments through the camera lens. A longtime enthusiast for the Memphis and Mid-South legacy and culture. Now, Lakeith feels strongly about the need to develop homegrown stories that reflect humanity and the spirit of hope, transformation, and redemption. He's no stranger to the entertainment world. As a matter of fact, we'll be getting into the fact that he was a music man. Yes, a songwriter, artist manager, event producer, and all-around promoter of Memphis. And he is the founding member member of Memphis Filmworks. So Lakeithan is going to be here today. Let me, matter of fact, let me see if I can get him in the studio. Hey, Lakeithan. Christy Taylor. Hello. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm excited. Okay. I'm excited yeah. too. I'm really excited. I really am. Okay. Now, hello, everybody. Feel free to participate. This is a live conversation and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you all why I'm excited. Number one, I've known Lakeith, and I'm, I hope he'll tell our L.A. connection story uh, <laughs> on how we initially met. And then we will segue into why I, I have such a, a fondness for him, a love for him uh, for so many reasons. But first of all, hey, Lakeith. Hey, Chrissy Taylor. So how did we meet? So you're not you're not a one name person. You are Christy Taylor, right? <laughs> Hi, Thank Christy you, Taylor. Lakeith and Mason. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I got them. I would like for them to know how how deep our relationship goes because we have we have so many similar loves for film and Memphis. Yeah. Uh, so can you kind of give them a little bit on how how far we go back? I believe about ten or eleven years ago, you were pursuing film school in Los Angeles. And I was working with On Location Memphis at the time. We were trying to figure out how do we make Memphis an epicenter for, for music, for film, uh, for entertainment. I went out to LA uh, with Angela Green and we had dinner and all of a sudden pops up this lady named Christy Taylor. <laughs> Now, I, I knew Christy Taylor from the radio, and I was a fan, but I'd never met Christy Taylor. And I thought Christy Taylor was one of these, these, these amazing people that I would never, ever meet. Oh. And I certainly never met her in Memphis, right. yet, she's, yet she's from Memphis or was based in Memphis and decided to move. So I had to go all the way out to Los Angeles, <laughs> California, to finally meet someone that I admired from radio and only knew by voice. And I saw a beautiful face and we were friends for life. We've been friends for life yeah. since then. So we have a, a decade of history yeah. with one another. Uh, we both endeavored the path of music, of film, of event production, yeah. you name it. Uh, the arts and culture of Memphis. Yeah. A year and a half later, Christy decides to return home to Memphis. <laughs> and it was... It was good in the sense that, oh, great, she's, she's coming to Memphis. But I was a little disappointed in the sense that I needed more friends in L.A. to stay in Hollywood so I could get to Hollywood and have an opportunity to enjoy right. Hollywood with friends that I know. Right. Yeah. So I was happy. It was bittersweet. But <laughs> her coming home was the best decision that she's ever made. Oh, the best decision that I will always cherish Aww. and appreciate. So, Christy, thank you for coming home and thank you for delighting Memphis with your personality, with your with your vision, uh, uh, with your voice. It's it's it's, uh, it's been it was amazing and it is amazing. So, thank you, Christy, for coming home. Well, thank you That's very much. I, 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 you know, he he put extra sugar on the story this time, and I'm like, oh my god! No, what is this? It's root beer. <laughs> Thank you. And first of all, I just want to say thank you. Um, I really have appreciated meeting so many Memphians, even in L.A., because you said we do have a very strong community of Memphians in Los Angeles. And it's always good to have that L.A. Memphis connection. Absolutely. And 
And I really am grateful that, like you say, that we met in L.A. And even when I came back home, it's like I already knew I had somebody on a certain level. Like, oh, OK, I know I got Lakeith in back home that I can connect with and really be our artsy, cinematic, nerdy selves when it comes to art and culture, as he said. A special what's up again to you, Leonard James. Thank you so much hey, for Leonard. hanging out with us. Hey. Also, Mildred Gilliam. Thank you. And Owen OS, we just know him. That's um our neighbors, our stories. Uh, he he decided to be uh, incognito with his name, but this is Lakeithan Mason. Lakeithan Mason is the executive director of Memphis Filmworks. And um, before you get into what has become your staging, you really had long history in the art community in the music world. Can we kind of talk about that real quick? Sure. Uh, songwriter, I. I've written about 40 to 45 songs that have been published and uh, sung and covered by local artists, either when I was in Ohio, well, where I produced my very first album, to now Memphis, where we've recorded uh, a dozen or more records here in Memphis. That also encouraged me and prompted me to help artists out. Uh, so I became an artist manager, a music manager. Uh, managing artists like Big Baby, Tamika Goodman, um, working with Cletus Allen uh, Jr. as a comedian and other other artists as well. And that was definitely meaningful uh, and an incredible journey and continues to be an incredible journey. Uh, just because you say well, you, 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 uh, you were a songwriter, I'm actually not, I, I, if, if, I, if I choose to, I'm like Babyface, I can pull out a pen. I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, write a song. Yeah, but yeah. what actually connected me to the picture and the lens was actually filling a need and a, a gap for the artists that I was managing mm -hmm. and the records we were making. Social media, YouTube became a very important component of promoting that artist. And at the time, I was still kind of had my feet in corporate America and had some opportunities to use some of that discretionary income, which that's not the case anymore, but I was able to use that discretionary, uh, discretionary income to actually buy some cameras mm -hmm. and start helping with their social media presence. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, I started experimenting with, uh, with cameras and uh, went from one camera to the next and started filming their shows, mm -hmm. started filming their interviews and started building their social media presence. It benefited them. But also it has benefited me because I fell in love with, I fell in love with the camera and I fell in love with the story that the lens captures that sometimes we don't even think about. Yeah. But when someone else gets to engage and experience it, they teach you something about what you actually captured. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was that was very fulfilling. And so went from songwriting to capturing artists on film to then doing documentaries and, and documenting other artists, other historians, working with other legendary uh, artists and producing their videos. Um, we also got an opportunity to uh, begin recording and doing short stories on legends like Tom Lee and uh, the Tom Lee story. Mm -hmm. uh, being Even being invited to, uh, to film the celebration and home going of Miriam DaCosta Willis, mm -hmm. who now holds the deepest, mm -hmm. uh, deepest part of my heart mm -hmm. because what she did in life, I am on my way to doing in my life. And so her story in itself of honoring notable Black Memphians and other notable uh, people uh, in the city has given me motivation, license, and validity Yeah, what I'm doing. And I have to say, when I started this process of Our Neighbors, Our Stories, I didn't necessarily know what it would entail. And I mm -hmm. certainly didn't know we would be at this point where we're now uh, not only capturing the voices and the faces of neighborhood residents all over Memphis and all over the Mid-South, mm -hmm. but also interpreting it and honoring them through a book that will be here on this earth way beyond way beyond ourselves. So 
Wow. It's, it's been a, it's been an amazing journey. I know I've skipped a few steps, but no, this is fine because I know how to rewind. I know how to rewind. <laughs> you do, you do. <laughs> but but, but this, this, this moment, but this is where we're going. It's, it's yeah, all, I, I can't say this. It's indescribable, but it's it's a moment that that allowed me to realize just how important our narrative it is. Mm -hmm. We're our stories and our lives should not have a shelf life. It should not even be a sound bite. It should be a narrative and a pearl of wisdom that stands the test of time. Our Neighbors, Our Stories mm -hmm. is the beginning of that. It's the beginning of that. And I thank the memory of Miriam mm -hmm. DeCosta Willis mm -hmm. for paving the way. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. You know, Lakeith, and, you know, you are a native son of the region. Um, uh, born and raised in the old Cordova, yeah, <laughs> in, the old, uh, in the real Cordova. Um, right. So I, I know you understand the richness of this community and the region, not just the city, but the whole entire region. Uh, and because you were a musician and a storyteller through song for so many years, how has that influenced you cinematically? Well, the, cin cinematically. Hmm, that's a good question. Cinematically, now, and uh, I, actually, I, I was thinking about this question that you asked that I was not prepared, wasn't necessarily prepared to answer, but good question. I think cinematically, being one, a songwriter, hearing music, hearing sound, understanding how words e evoke emotion and feeling and, and, and challenges our sensibilities. So as someone who hears music, loves music and writes music you're 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 able to actually see that play out and you know what to look for uh when mm -hmm. you're when you're documenting or when you're filming or when you're working with a subject that may be challenged with uh mm -hmm. the direction of, mm -hmm. uh, of their feelings or of their responses but because you're you're able to tap into what that word means beyond mm -hmm. the statement it gives you an it gives you a deeper sense of what to look for uh, even as an interviewer and we mm -hmm. through this series this particular series we've interviewed over 780 families and residents okay i gotta pause i gotta pause because number one I, I i don't want you to rush through this i want them to understand the scope okay of what you have done um You've approached this definitely like a record producer. You have been able to be almost like in the studio with people, nurturing them to tell their stories, like you would tell, like you would an artist in the studio booth, um, coaxing them to hit the right note, so to speak. But can we take it back to the founding of the Memphis Film Works and how this particular project became your signature project? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Back in 2019, the spring of 2019, mm -hmm. we had just completed a workshop, an empowerment summit um, called oh. On the Road to We. Yeah. And it was about how we as a community can develop a shared sense of belonging, whether we're dealing with inequities and whether, whether we're dealing with community development or restoration. And a week later, I get an invite from the National Civil Rights Museum saying the Atlantic Festival was going to be held in our city and the special guest would be Rip Ransom, mm. who is the chief executive of the Kresge Foundation, which is based out of Detroit, Michigan. When I was excited to go, because they wanted to talk about racial equity. They wanted to talk about how do we see diversity as a plus uh, for economic mm -hmm. prosperity, as an advantage, as a benefit? And Memphis has a complex history yeah. of race, of economic status, uh, mm -hmm. of class uh, and distinction. But we've managed it. But of course, this is the time when we needed to unpack uh, how do we truly be authentic to being, uh, being equitable. Uh, across the board. So the Kresge Foundation offered an opportunity for grassroots organizations to provide solutions to improving the story of racial equity in Memphis. 
Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity that I'm like, this is exciting. This is the work that we were already doing. Mm -hmm. Whether we were meeting with, with, with young men at, maxima, at a Maximizing Man at Symposium, or we were uh, engaging poets and writers at our live speak conferences where, uh, where, where people were able to express themselves. We were already on track, but being an organization at this point, we didn't necessarily have the resources that matched the vision of being able to go and sit on the front porches of 300 families <laughs> and residents in Memphis. That, yeah. that takes a resource and it takes time, right? Yeah. Um, the time to do that and the, the, the sold out commitment to do it. stay on course. Yeah. I presented it, I made a proposal to Kresge Foundation to visit 300 families in Memphis over a two year period. Wow. And I was very nervous because I didn't know, I'm thinking, oh man, they got, that's hungry children out there. You know, <laughs> you know, folks with broke feet, you know, <laughs> there's no way they're going, there's no way they're going to invest in this vision or this strategy um, that was deeply rooted in my heart. Well, to my surprise, two months later, they, really? asked, me, they asked me a few questions. I had to take mm -hmm. a deep breath with those questions. And they finally said yes. They said this is a novel idea. This is an i. This is a great idea because you're providing voice, right, to individuals who may not have been seen in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And of course, yes, I knew that, right? I mean, this but is know this, right? right. Can I pause? It doesn't take a consultant. It doesn't take a. No, consultant. it doesn't take a. And let me just right here. Wherever. It doesn't take a consultant to do it. Actually, it's mm -hmm. going into the neighborhood, mm -hmm. talking right. to your neighbors, and asking what can be done to help preserve, promote, and sustain a healthy life and community for all. And that's what we did. So mm -hmm. once we got that support, we we began our journey and mm -hmm. uh, and and started looking for people and asking people in very specific neighborhoods right. how they felt about their neighborhood, how they felt about their neighbor, and what about their culture and their story mm -hmm. provides significance to the greater story of Memphis. And it but started- I, mean, it I got, love it. it I, 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 I wanted to say that, you know, one reason why, you know, for those who, I don't want them to miss the fact that when you're going to a foundation that says we want to fund things to improve a community, Oftentimes, I want to put the pin right there, that we as artists, we may not feel like, as he said, well, there's hungry children, or I don't have a feeding program, or I don't have anything that's medically related that can really be like, okay, I see. But the arts are equally important because you, you have become a voice to the voiceless in the communities that oftentimes are overlooked. And can you kind of, for those who don't understand, I'm just going to use it, cultural anthropology or sociology, yeah. why the Kresge Foundation felt like this is a worthy cause for the average person to understand how this journalistic uh, approach really does help our communities? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. you, you mentioned an anthropologic roadmap. Yeah. A roadmap that allows us to engage a large number of people or a large pool of individuals who are directly affected by the decisions that are made through policy, by influence, influencers outside and inside of their mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. What was most attractive to Kresge was the fact that there was going to be an investment in engaging mm -hmm. marginalized families and residents who don't often have an opportunity to be at the table with their voice. Uh, I found out that that was really the key to mm -hmm. them connecting to this project. Mm -hmm. And when you're hearing 300 voices that's giving you their thoughts on how to improve their lives, how to better their situations, it is a much better beat on the pulse yeah. of how we can actually respond. Mm -hmm. But if we don't approach the individuals who are directly affected by decisions that may or may not even benefit them, it's not gonna benefit the community in the long run. And right. it certainly won't be sustained without the direct input of individuals who have to be in those 
neighborhoods. They have to love their neighborhoods and they have to love the the situations or the decisions that are being made either on on behalf on their behalf or with their voice. So this distinctive voices of opinion was the magic to this process. And the fact that we were filming it and the fact that we were able to provide some input on a larger scale to other organizations on how they can better engage uh, smaller communities, um, it, it became a, a huge database, anthropologic database, archeologic database of understanding how we coexist and how we equitably share space within our city that's prosperous, prosperous and that is beneficial to all. You know, that is so important because I know that you, um, like myself, we are very connected to the community on, on different levels. And I know for you personally, you're extremely uh, politically connected and you're also connected to the nonprofit sectors and your work. When you say politically connected, what do you mean? I mean, you know, people who are elected officials, you know, civic leaders, you know, people, you know, uh, those highfalutin folk with them good jobs is making these policies and these decisions. And for you to do this kind of work really does give them the data when they're campaigning or when they're making policy or when they're pushing legislation through. Um, have you had opportunities to talk to some of the people about what you are doing and what are some of their feedback? We have. Uh, I have. Uh, we, we've had an opportunity, uh, I think last month, we were mm -hmm. at the state capitol uh, mm -hmm. in, in Nashville. And a part, of, a part of our actual storytelling, we have some notable uh, politicians who are part of the series, who share their stories, their, their deep connection mm -hmm. uh, to the sides of Memphis that they grew up on and uh, were, 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 raised, uh, were mm -hmm. raised upon and raised in. So yes, uh, we, we've had those discussions. We have even had uh, conversations about how do we now, now that we're creating a space that mm -hmm. speaks yes, symbolically, mm -hmm. metaphorically, we now need a space that speaks physically every day on how we maintain and sustain uh, a culture that people can, a culture of understanding where people can have meaningful discussions, have difficult discussions mm -hmm. in a safe space and a safe place and continue to deliver upon the promises that need to be kept and executed uh, throughout the process. One particular state representative, and won't mention the name, I, I asked this particular state representative, who's now a state senator, <laughs> Yeah. Clues, clues, and more clues. <laughs> right. I asked her. I asked her one simple question. I asked, her, "Why is it that politicians can't keep their promises?" Wow. And what she said wow. amazed me. She said, "When you are entering this political climate, mm -hmm. and you're now invited to the state legislature, you're." the 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 capital capitol hill right it becomes a club and in mm -hmm. order for you to get any legislation passed there's mm -hmm. negotiation that mm -hmm. happens and oftentimes when mm -hmm. her colleagues or her peers see that she does not have the background noise of voice from her constituents there it is. An opportunity to veto and drown her desires out for her mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. and, so and in other know. in other words, if she if, if they see that she doesn't have a strong voice supporting her initiatives, correct, it becomes very difficult to pass legislation that benefits not only her district or her her area, but it also okay. makes it difficult to get yeah. things done, right? Yeah. So the louder we speak as her as constituents, yeah. and the more we are informed and understand mm -hmm. about what the needs are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the better position that legislator can be. 
And, and what I've seen is that- in You just gave a strong civic lesson in that statement. Uh, okay, I learned folks, that. I learned that. I didn't know say that. the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Right. And the louder we squeak and you amplify your voice from the community, then the person you've elected can take your voice, amplify to their job, to push things through. So that's a strong civic lesson. That's right. So we, we on the ground mm -hmm. need, we, they need us. They need us, to speak yes. speak loudly, yes. not quietly, not get apathetic, not, yeah. not become disengaged. Because mm -hmm. that disengagement, it, 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 de -escal it de depowers or, or de-emphasizes yeah. person, that legislator's position for the people mm -hmm. they want to fight for. So if we don't want them to become absorbed in the club, then Ooh. we've got to keep our voices loud and we've got to find ways here in the city to make sure our voices are documented, recorded, and that are constantly in the ears, in the faces of legislators that don't want us to be there. Right and those legislators who need to stay there to continue fighting for us. We must fight for them first. See, that's what I've always loved about being in media, uh, because you're able to give voice to situations, news, opportunities, keeping the community informed. But one of the things that I love as I started le learning about the power of film, and in this case, documentary work, is that you can craft a narrative and you can create opportunities to really give those who are voiceless a voice and those who are faceless a face. And once it's documented in old school, you say once it was on the celluloid, now of course it's, uh, <laughs> once it's in the digital world, it can't be erased. They said what they said, you saw them in their condition. That's why Michael Moore, um, the filmmaker, the documentarian, um, Ken Burns, other famous, um, oh, cool. You know, once you capture those stories, you cannot unhear them. You cannot unhear the voices. So let's talk about once you really got the funding and you're on this two year, I want you to understand a two year journey um, to capture 300, over 300 individuals and families. Who are some of the ones that really stood out to you? And what was the, I would say, what was the overarching theme that has emerged from our neighbors, our stories, the documentary, and then we're going to get to the book. Mm. Well, that is the book. That is the book. Um, but I, and what I'm what I'm saying about it, I'm learning to, to to contain my emotions because yeah. when I think about some of the residents and the families that we engage, it moved me to no end. And I will tell you one of the reasons why this moment or those moments meant so much to me. And I will, I'll answer your question. Three years before my grandmother passed, mm -hmm. she was working very hard to find her family, uh, to mm -hmm. find family members. She was the last living uh, daughter of Riley Walton. And she wanted to make sure that we knew her family. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes in, in families in the paternal makeup of our histology or our, our historic uh, lineage, yeah. we kind of father, we follow the father, right. right? And in this sense, she really wanted us to know her side of the family, right. but even herself, she didn't know, she didn't know as many as she wanted to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At that time, I had no interest. Uh, I was like, you know, my grandma, that, that's wonderful. Congratulations. She had our poster boards up. She had our Chris uh, all written out. And, uh, and she would say, hey, can you find something? Oh, grandma, that sounds wonderful. I got to go. I got to go to the Grizzlies game uh, or I need to take care of something else at that time. And her name was Thelma. And one of the very first interviews that I did, it was with Miss Thelma Glover of the same name. She was 101 years old. And her family decided when, when we asked them mm -hmm. uh, if we could document their story, their family was excited. Yeah. They, were, they were so excited that they chose the family member with the biggest house so they can get the largest number of people wow. in the room. 
and I walked in with my cameras and I saw 60 people what? In, in this house, in the house. And I cried. I was like, you all think this is, y'all really think this is important to say, yes, my grandmother Thelma wants to speak and she's 101 years old. And I don't know if she will be able to speak again. After that moment, I knew that there was something about this. There was something about being able to connect the story and the legacy, not only of our elders, but of people who are who have walked this earth, that have contributed to society in quiet and loud ways. Just when we, when we talk about the essential worker, the fact that this great grandmother hundred lived a hundred years on yeah. this earth. Yeah. She's contributed something. Yeah. If if not just raising great family mm -hmm. members yeah. and mm -hmm. keeping them sane, whole, and proud enough mm -hmm. to bring uh, to bring 60 people into the room to speak mm -hmm. with and for Big Mom. Wow. It it was an it was an a, a, a amazing revelation of what we miss out on when we ignore Mm -hmm. the moment to capture what could be pearls of wisdom and a lifetime of happiness and healthy solutions for the next generations. So mm -hmm. that was that that was that 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 turnkey moment. I'm like, wow, okay, I've got the energy to do this because I got the motivation to do this because mm -hmm. I see what it means. Right. So the so we we saw Miss Glover Turn 102 oh. in May. Yeah, we were at our birthday party, which yeah. was a dry, it was a drive-through uh, party, and mm -hmm. then we attended her funeral. Wow! But we had that moment. Yes, yes. That her life will never be forgotten, and the contribution she made to her family will be written in stone. So what this means to me and what this means to a lot of family members throughout the city is an opportunity to share their experience, to be a part of an area of, of, our, of history that oftentimes is left yeah. untold, unrecognized, and mm -hmm. unappreciated. Our neighbors, our stories, uh, it took a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And I learned to appreciate what my grandmother was trying to do that I ignored. And so I have committed myself to never ignoring. Wow. The, key the voice that... of another person. That should mean more to us than we give them credit for. That's the voice of our peers. That's the voice that politicians need to help fight for us and advocate for us. It's the voice that our children need to hear. So when they make the decision to get back in line yes. and understand their power, yes. they'll have something to refer to. Lakeith and I appreciate you being so vulnerable. This is another reason why at the beginning of this, I said that I have such a, a, a strong love and appreciation for him because he understands the work. He understands the power of the work. And um, I know behind you, you also have a- See, I didn't do this this morning. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, he had an interview earlier today. I said, oh, okay, okay. He's talking about the voice of the voiceless. Okay, okay. Um, but I appreciate you sharing your heart with me. I really do. And I value that. And I value that you had told me earlier before we got started that speaking about your own grandmother that you have behind you an amazing mm -hmm. photo as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about who that is and how he has also the other way. <laughs> the, the other way. <laughs> yes, that one. Uh, now, who is this gentleman again? And who are these people? Well, Speaking of the paternal side, this is yeah. 
this is my grandfather, uh, Solomon mm -hmm. Brady, in the very center. Okay. I take after him, and he's the heavier guy, and the other guys are the taller, slimmer. Um, they're all handsome guys, but this is my grandmother, uh, grandfather, uh, Solomon Brady, and his brothers. Yeah. There were 12 of them, uh, wow. five brothers, seven sisters. Wow. And what I love about the story of these men is that they all decided to build their homes right next door to each other, mm -hmm. uh, and they were... They were the neighbors. I was primarily uh, raised in my grandparents' home. Mm -hmm. And so my neighbors were my aunties, my first, second, third cousins. And uh, we, we had a large bond. And I think why, the, why, this is, why this was important, after World War II, uh, they, there were land, land grant, uh, that land grants that were available to build. And their father, uh, ben Brady Sr. decided to purchase 60 acres of Whoa. land in Cordova, uh, Bridgewater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he uh, actually gave each, each of the family members two and a half acres to build mm -hmm. on if they wanted. Every one of the brothers decided that they would build. Um, interestingly enough, the sisters lived in the city. Uh, um, but all of the brothers uh, lived yeah. right next door to one another and built their homes, raised their families, and created legacies um, that will blow your mind um, yeah. as neighbors. As, as neighbors. neighbors. And see, that's the kind of stories that oftentimes a picture or a book or a Bible, I mean, artifacts that we have in our homes, a hat or a coat or a jacket, things that we like, oh, that's just grandma's collection of figurines but why did she start collecting that or you know it's like we miss yeah. history all around us and you know i know everybody can't be an archivist everybody can't be into creating museums but at least we can collect the oral history or the video history um that that surrounds us every single day and it does shape our communities it literally does if you understand the lady across the street who taught 50 years and pretty much, I mean, you would have a greater respect after she's retired, her investment in a community or the youngest person that you meet, you know, who has a story. Matter of fact, who was the youngest person that you can remember out of 300 um, that you interviewed for the Our Neighbors, Our Stories? The, ooh, the young, I think the youngest uh -huh. that I can recall, her name is Jadia Murphy. Mm -hmm. And she was the valedictorian of Melrose High School in 2020. And she talked about her upbringing, but also her experience as a Melrose golden wildcat. I hope I get that right. <laughs> you got to get it right. If yeah. not, they're going to get, get it right. <laughs> it's golden be, or wild. It's either a golden cat. cat or a wildcat. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's golden wildcats. but Golden wildcats. Yeah. But I think Hamlin, <laughs> Hamilton also has this, as a mascot of a wildcat, but I don't think it's the golden. So I think I think I got yeah, it right. Was, yeah, I'm going I got it wrong. Anybody that's anybody that wants to chat and let <laughs> me know because I want to make sure I get it right because that's important yes. when you're mm -hmm. when you're recording and you're documenting that you're accurate. Yeah, uh, and, and not uh, not over interpreting uh, yeah. the story, right? right? And that's what I loved about the experience of not only filming and videoing the interviews, but also sharing the, uh, the opportunity to share this experience yeah. with uh, emerging writers and poets. I was about to say, let's talk about how do you get into that? Yeah, well, when, when, I, when I was trying to wrap my head around re-engaging these stories, mm -hmm. I wanted to share it right away, uh, but mm -hmm. I knew that there was a process. <clears throat> and so we started uh, working with writers and poets who are known Memphians, uh, spoken word artists, who had an opportunity to, to look at the film, to engage from a video experience, right, in this digital experience, and interpret what they saw, what they felt, and what it meant to them to have each individual share their particular experience. So that was the first point of engagement where these individuals oftentimes were younger uh, in age, 
their mm-hmm. minds were blown. They said, I had no idea <laughs> that this happened in, in Douglas mm-hmm. or that, that Douglas, Douglas, Douglas community was named after Frederick Douglass, yeah. right? a well-known abolitionist who has a book about a thousand pages, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, several books who wrote about world issues and the freedom and, and liberation of black folk. Mm-hmm. We are, Douglas as a community was built in 1906, wow. right after uh, Orange Mound uh, became mm-hmm. of existence. And so those two communities are so important to yes. the history and the legacy of Memphians, African-American mm-hmm. Memphians, who decided to move forward on their own and build Mm -hmm. for their own. And I know Orange Mound, which is a fabulous, fabulous place, um, has significant history and culture, but Douglas does as well. So does Smoky City, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So we get a chance to engage uh, people that told us why they call it Smoky City. Well, that was where all of the horseshoes uh, were being being made for the drawn carriages back in the early 1900s um, for, to carry people around. And these, and they were making iron gates and the, the welders created black smoke that would go up into the air. And they said, this is a smoky city. I'm like, wow. Okay, that's how you came up with the name mm-hmm. of Smoky City. But we also e- evaluated the migration patterns mm-hmm of the african-american experience right through these narratives Mm -hmm. Uh, and we had an opportunity to share that with other writers and other story consultants who then took took the time to almost study it like a textbook yeah and write their interpretation of what it meant to them to go through this experience yeah Um, so that that was that was very rewarding for them and for me, but it also taught me something about mm-hmm. that step of, of how do we how do we now leverage the opportunity to have conversations um, uh, around critical race theory or around uh, equity by evaluating the the stories and what they meant. We were I was looking at you asked me like some of the some of the t- stories or, or or some of the experiences. What came out of it were significant titles and themes that mm-hmm. I believe we can implement training programs around, right? and 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 show how how do how do we show up for one another, right? Yeah. Uh, one title you know, was about two late two ladies who became best friends via the relationship of their children, their teenage children. They became a family union. They became. A, a neighbor who showed up for one another in rough times and good times and in times of celebration, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so even the titles, we have a hundred stories and a hundred titles have become educational material for mm-hmm. how we better serve humanity uh, in this day and time. Now, so during that process of 2020, when we were just getting going, COVID happens. Yeah. And so we had to rethink how do we engage at this point? How do we create safe spaces and places and really create safe measures for those safe places to be safe in a health standpoint, mm-hmm. not just in an emotional, uh, an emotional standpoint, but how, how do we, how do we now keep ourselves healthy so that we can keep mm-hmm. going? Right. Uh, and then George Floyd happened. Yes. And the civil unrest occurred. Mm-hmm. And so it created a dynamic of uh, an a, and a energy that we had to deal with, right? And then there became this search for common ground. Where is our common ground? And when we reach that common ground, what are we going to do with it, right, for everyone? Uh, so this experience has been cathartic. Mm-hmm. It has been transformative mm-hmm. and, and it has been educational. And that education of how we see the, that particular time period in our lives, mm-hmm. those two years where we're still dealing with symptoms of, of COVID, it's still here. Mm-hmm. But as a people, we got mm-hmm. through it. Uh, mm-hmm. As a community, they got through it. Uh, as, 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 a, as a neighborhood and as a city, we found a way 
to seek a common ground by which to keep our lives going and to to keep um, our the spirit of resilience and redemption and restoration mm -hmm. an important common theme for all of us. Nobody wanted to succumb to COVID. Nobody. Nobody wanted to see a man lose his breath for nine minutes with a with a, a knee on it. So we came together and by coming together we were able to make some decisions for humanity that protected us all and gave us a sense of empathy that I don't think we had in 2018. Mm -hmm. Whether it was because of leadership or because we were in a sound bite um, world, yeah. world, world, world. Mm -hmm. we weren't listening to one another. No, right. Uh, everything was. If you can't, if you can't convince me, and first it started off thirty seconds, then it was fifteen seconds, and then seven yeah. seconds. <laughs> right. Everybody blew up in terms yeah. of going crazy. Yeah. In terms of trauma, they said, if you can't get out in three seconds, don't say nothing. <laughs> Right, right. Oh, I, it, it takes me lift. It takes three seconds for me to lift my hand. Let alone a voice, right? So we started. We started mm -hmm. censoring and muffling the power and the significance of one's voice mm -hmm. prior to COVID, which what which made this an important pilgrimage and an important journey. Mm -hmm. so when I, when I was working with or when we were interviewing families and residents, there was no time limit. There was, uh, we didn't say, hey, we only have 20 minutes for this interview. Some interviews last for three hours. What? Some interviews I had to change the camera batteries on because yeah. once, once the outpouring began, mm -hmm. once the spirit of the universe took over, mm -hmm. there were no walls mm -hmm. and there were no pauses in what people needed to share. We were masked physically, but when the mask came off, mm -hmm. there was a flood. Yeah. And there was a it was an experience of connection. There was a spirit of understanding. Mm -hmm. There is a spirit of common ground. We you are no different than I am. Yeah. There is not a label that you can put on yourself that can divide me and keep me from seeing you as a human being. Right. That's where we are. And that's where we, I hope that we stay, that we stop it with the labels and we start seeing people as people, as a part of the race, as a part of humanity, as a part of what we have to do together. Right. To not just survive. Mm -hmm. now thrive mm -hmm. and we do it with the consideration of everyone wow. best one wow you got some love in the room lawrence thomas just said big brothers in the house <laughs> <laughs> lawrence. yes you know I'm, I'm really glad that you have spoken to you know that prior to the pandemic how we have been driven to a three second sound bite or five second sound bite or snapchat or you know the brevity of being able to give voice to who and what you are and then to be able to have a project like this you say you had to change the batteries i mean that's some talking right there for those that don't know uh and let people really once once they open their heart to just let it flow and i'm just thinking as a person who understands what you did i'm like but you got so much footage you got years of content so many ways to repurpose this so many opportunities to share the stories and i know that you actually already had started even before you compile the book and i know the pre-sale of the book is available so for those who want to be a part of the journey as this is rolling out uh lakeith and mason please tell them how that they can join the journey now of wow. our neighbors our stories so we will be uh, launching our website our neighbors our stories dot org this friday this Friday, <laughs> you'll see our neighbors, our stories .org come to life. And what you'll see on that website is information on how you can pre order the book itself and see snippets of 
the 100 plus interviews that we conducted, compiled into this book uh, for the purpose of the public to see, to receive, and to share. So we're excited about Friday. Uh, it's like it's, it's, a, it's our Good Friday, right? It's our Good Friday. And we hope and expect people to support this because it, it's, it, it's, it's something that I always pray to God. It's a God. Give me a responsibility that is much larger than myself. Yeah, yeah. And I will say yes. This was one of them. I've had a couple, but the, but this is one of them. And, and, and I'm so glad that God has graced um, Grace Memphis Filmworks. Yeah. Uh, our my board of directors allowed me to do this and gave Come me. Come on, give him a shout out. Give him some love. The wings. And he said, and Lawrence said, congrats. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, so uh, Friday, Good Friday, April 1st, we were able to pre-order. Now, I, I will show you, you know, I was told not to, not to show it, but this is this is the book. This is the this is not the book. This is the proof <laughs> that the printer. I was about it. to say that book is already worn. How it you is, <laughs> it's already worn. But what what you'll see inside of each of these these are these are the pages of the lives of Memphians who don't always get a chance to participate in the process, but they have something to say. So members like Draper Cox have their own five page story that tells them about how they overcame obstacles and how they are planning their lives better to serve their family and humanity in a much more powerful way. This was a powerful experience for everyone. Um, so you no, will see it, it is 500 pages. 500, okay, so, let me get this straight. Hold on, I, I'm just gonna, I gotta holler, what? Okay, you, you interviewed over 300 people how many people were your story contributors to end up with 500 pages? So 100, 100 stories on average, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, I didn't put a limit on the, uh, on, the, on the depth of the interview. Therefore, I also didn't put a limit on how people were inspired to write about our neighbors. Okay. It, so that was, that was the, the agreement. So there, there are some stories that may be 10 pages long. There may be some stories that are two pages long, but the fact is their voice is heard, their shared experience is understood and is captured in a way that will be a blueprint mm -hmm. for how we study culture mm -hmm. and how we align and agree mm -hmm. with the universal pr principles mm -hmm. of goodness and grace and faith. You know, you've already talked about curriculum, educational curriculum. You know, I, I know you can't share everything that is going to be unfolding out of the Our Neighbors, Our Stories um, blueprint or system. But what can we expect as the book comes out? Of course, the pre-sale, once again, Our Neighbors, Our Stories org. The full launch is happening this Friday. You heard it here on the Christy Taylor Show Special Edition. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you. I we are going to celebrate on May 19th mm -hmm. at the Halloran Center at six o'clock. We are going to put a medallion on the necks of our neighbors or in the hands of our neighbors saying, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for continuing to hold up the banner of being a mid Southerner mm -hmm. and a Memphian, even when they did not acknowledge you. They will, a hundred residents will be acknowledged. A hundred residents and families will walk the stage of the Halloran Center so that we can say thank you for being our neighbor. I'm glad it's during the Memphis and May festivities. So we, 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 we are going to celebrate uh, starting so on May 19th. That is, the, that is the, the, the official kickoff, right? And, and yes. the reason the reason I'm accelerating and probably accelerating and accelerated, uh, what exuberated <laughs> two years, two, ye two, two years, two years to the date, two years of walking the park with with our neighbors, getting to know people that I never met before, asking, engaging in conversation for two years with my camera on my shoulder, with 
my batteries to back up the long conversations. <laughs> and then to walk into the office of the Assisi Foundation and say, this has to be in a book. And so then eight months of writing every story, editing every story, going through to make sure that every story has truth. Yes. And every truth, every truth has purpose. Yeah. Of where the story should go and how it should influence and inspire us. And then working through the process, I, I, I went to several different publishing companies, print press companies, and it was something about walking the journey mm -hmm. of putting this book together that I wanted to do. Yeah, I, I, I did it to myself, <laughs> but I wanted to do it. So film, book, celebration. And the celebration is really just the kickoff mm -hmm. of the future conversations we will have yeah. all across the city. Yeah. On how do we serve humanity and one another in a meaningful, purposeful, and more equitable way that we all feel welcome at the table and every voice, no matter how strong, weak, or raspy it is, is heard and it is appreciated and it is acted upon. Yes. That's okay. going to be the work. That's it. The journey was figuring out how to do it or how the to get there. The documentation of it. Mm -hmm. Now the work experience, mm -hmm. the experience of the work is now going back to these same neighbors and say, hey, we've got a table for you. Can you come to this table yeah. and discuss what you meant by I love greens? <laughs> <laughs> right? Collard greens. I love collard greens. Can, yeah. you, can you help us? Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand how to be a better neighbor Mm -hmm. in a in a more uh, a more civically engaged mm -hmm. resident yeah. for those who may not understand exactly what you have done to maintain and sustain the mm -hmm. dignity of this city yes we're going to get to the bottom of a lot of a lot of stuff mm -hmm. good and bad yeah. but we're going to create a safe space where our conversations have meaning mm -hmm. and they have purpose mm -hmm. and the truth of that purpose will transform this city in a wow. way that we've never seen it before. And keep in mind, this is volume one. Woo! This is volume, volume one. So this, volume. This, this is something that I, I hope and pray that everyone will, will embrace mm -hmm like Henry Louis Gates. Mm -hmm. And they will provide their shared experiences and their stories as a part of this anthology that has the opportunity to give face and presence to individuals who would not ordinarily be in the social media realm or the social media gauntlet, right? Uh, you just pulled up this, uh, this picture and Abadeli Coyote, uh, who is a known as an educator in the Hickory Hill area, Adeli Gamero, who is an immigrant that has been here for 20 years and has built a jewelry making business in uh, mm -hmm. Memphis that also serves young women who are disenfranchised, teaches them a trade mm -hmm. on how to make jewelry, and continues to build. Um, uh, to build philanthropy mm -hmm. and solve some of the solutions that that that, that need to be solved and resolved and con connecting community. Mm -hmm. This is about engagement. It's about it's about reconnecting uh, our hearts, mm -hmm. uh, reconnecting our intent, mm -hmm. right? and restoring our sense of humanity and belonging to this human race that we're all a part of. 
Yeah. It doesn't mean that we run this race the same way. That's what makes us unique and distinct. Yeah. Let's see what distinction can now do mm. that the monolith has never been able to do. We have been talking this past hour to Lakeithan Mason, executive director of Memphis Film Works, about his latest project, a documentary work that he's done almost three years, Our Neighbors, Our Stories, a documentary series, and now a collective narrative that is going to be something you will want to put in your personal library, Our Neighbors, Our Stories, an oral narrative collection, volume one. And again, just showing the massiveness of the people that are featured in this, a hundred stories out of the 300 he interviewed over a two year period. And the new website where you can actually get this information is going to be our neighbors, our stories.org for the pre-sale. The website launches this Friday. In the meantime, check out memphisfilmworks.com, the book pre-sales, our neighbors, our stories.org. And of course, you can actually start the journey even now going to social media, Facebook and Instagram, our neighbors, our stories. And if you love Twitter, it's our neighbors underscore. That's Twitter, our neighbors underscore. Wow, Lakeithan. Wow. And we also need team members. We need staff members. If 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 any of it anyone has has the time to commit to uh it, it's a small gesture, but some some time to commit to developing this repository mm -hmm. uh, of of history, Memphis history, and you want to be a part of that, Memphis Filmworks and Lakeith and Mason would love to have you. Would love wow. to have you. All right. Opportunities for all my history buffs out there. You can actually help uh, an amazing collection that may one day end up at the National Civil Rights Museum or the African-American Museum in D.C. and other museums around the world. And who knows, maybe one day there's actually a museum in its own name. May I add something real quick? Yes, you can. Because I, I know we are way over time. I, no, no, this is your show, honey. This is your no, this, show. No, this is your show. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to mess up the advertisers and the sponsors. Right? Well, thank you to our advertisers and sponsors. I want to tell you, in Chicago, there is this website called historymaker.org. And if you've never been there, if you've never gone to it, yes. you would understand why it's an exciting, exciting a piece of information. Mm -hmm. The founder of historymakers.org decided uh, over a decade and a half ago that they wanted to have the largest repository of African-American experiences in the world. They have, they have done it. They are doing it. Memphis can too. And so when I look at the opportunities that Memphis offers, and as it relate as it relates to digitizing our history, understanding our our presence here in the history and the culture of Memphis, recording it and making it available to young kids who don't even know how great the stories and the experiences have been, how great Memphians are no matter whether they stay in Memphis or they go and, and develop historical uh, programs at Ohio State University. The, a Memphian from Douglas, Tennessee, what actually founded the mm -hmm. political science and African-American studies program at Ohio State University, mm -hmm. which is now the most prestigious African-American studies program in the world. A so Memphian we, from Douglas. A Memphian from, from Douglas, Douglas. Right? So mm -hmm. we get a chance to work together, mm -hmm. to uncover mm -hmm. and discover the amazing contributions that Mid-Southerners and Memphians have made and continue to make, make. right? In throughout, throughout history, in the world, and mm -hmm. here in our city. We mm -hmm. have to give ourselves the opportunity to say we are significant. Yes. We have done significant things and we have the right 
and we have the joy to celebrate one another in our experience. That's what we're doing. That's what you're doing, Christy. And I, I, I appreciate and encourage you to continue to do it. And we're going we're going we're going to put Memphis into the global consciousness of the world because that's where we deserve to be. That's where we belong in the global consciousness of yes. the world. Mm, thank you so much. And um, I just want to acknowledge you when you talked about historymakers.com and many Memphians have been acknowledged in that collection, including one of my mentors, my one of my creative mentors, Benny Nelson West. Yes. One of the founders of the Memphis uh, Black Arts Alliance. That's right. The Firehouse. And so as Lakeithan takes this to another generation, documenting and celebrating Memphians who are doing global impacting work. Um, and truly, indeed, we want to um, honor everyone from the person who's many people are who's seen and unheard and That's who right. was unseen and unheard um, to be seen and to be heard. So Amen. Thank, you all, thank you all so very much. Be sure to share this. This is such an amazing interview um, because he is giving us an insight into something that's going to have a global impact. And I want you all to be able to say, I, I heard it here. I heard it here. Lakeith and Mason, the executive director of Memphis Filmworks and the creator of the Our Neighbors, Our Stories. Check it out online. And thank y'all so much for hanging out with us on this Tuesday afternoon. Thank y'all. Thank you, Memphis. Thank you, Christy. Love thank you. you. Love you too. Thank you.